Well, that's good for me. Um, you know, I, I know I don't want to give any spoilers, right? Because I know you haven't finished the series, but um, you do need to eventually get to the end of Breaking Bad. And it's, it's not the last episode, but it's in the last season where Ozymandias is sort of the theme, you know, um, and I, I mean, I didn't know the poem growing up. I know students today probably do, um, or the poem, there's two poems, right? There's two poems, but really the one by um, Percy Shelley is the one that everybody knows. Right, right. Um, everybody forgot the one by Horace Smith. Well, the, the Shelley one's scary as hell, right? Like it's, <laughs> it, you know, it, it feels like a, um, an encounter on the game Civilization, right? You, you meet uh -huh. some other foreign power and uh, they try and intimidate you. It, it's got that in, intimidating language, right? As part of the um, remaining inscription to this broken statue. Yeah, well, and it's got this almost... And maybe I read it this way because he was married to Mary Shelley, but it's like a very gothic way to describe a monument. Like it feels haunted. Mm -hmm. um, like he's not just encountering a dead monument, but it's like the ghost of Ozymandias almost. Um, my first encounter with it, I also did not grow up with it. I actually learned it from Alien Covenant. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I kind of associated with that. I can't not hear like Michael Fassbender reading it, dropping a bio weapon on a bunch of aliens. So it's the only way to be. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, the, the name, um, you know, we, we had talked before about it, you know, being some kind of alternate name or thronal name or royal title of Ramses the second. Um, how it got to be that way, you know, from, I mean, I read the Egyptian as Usr Ma'atra, you know, uh, and I know what Ma'atra and Ra, you know, the, the justice or divine sort of, well, call it divine justice. That's good enough for me. Um, destiny, right? You know, like, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's a heavier yeah. concept, Ma'at, but uh, of Ra, you know, the, you know, the, the sun god. Um, and what was, it's something about uh, that uh, I forget, but somehow it makes its way into Greek, and then it makes its way from Greek centuries, millennia later, into the hands of poets and a, a, a contest, right? You know, and right. um, it, it's interesting on a number of levels because it's, well, it's a name. I, I don't know that it reflects any real monument per se so much as it does like the idea of a broken Ramsey statue, maybe. Do you know? I, I, I just don't even know. I've looked into this, yeah. So it's quite interesting. Um, there was a statue attributed to Ramsey's that was going to be brought to the British Museum. Um, now, I don't know if it actually was a statue of Ramsey's because the 19th dynasty stole a bunch of other people's Mm. statues and so a lot of statues of Ramesses are statues of earlier pharaohs that he just put his name on um <laughs> but it was the ancient Egyptians thought it was Ramses but um Horace Smith and Percy Shelley probably never saw it um they decided to have a competition to write a poem about it before it arrived at the British Museum so that both would be published sort of as like advertising um, although they were legitimately interested in it, but I guess like people theorize that they never actually saw it, um, which is why they both quote different inscriptions on the monument, neither okay. of which is actually there because they didn't see it. And then they're describing broken pieces, which I'm pretty sure don't actually exist. It's just Shelley's version seems to suggest it's just a leg. Mm. Um, but I think it's actually the torso. Um, who was the, well, I think, doesn't it say the torso-less or no, trunk-less? Some, anyway, uh, we'll go it's back over like and read it. Um, the, the interesting thing, and I think this is where, you know, it, it really collides with your research. I know you even cited it in, in one of your articles, but um, beyond that, 
where I think it's interesting for you research wise is, you know, this poetry contest that is PR, right? It's, it's marketing, it's advertising, like it, it's the reception of something that, you know, this is beyond a, a third or fourth way of encountering, you know, a, a monument or, or monumental text, you know, and it seems as though monuments more broadly, especially monuments with inscriptions, monuments and texts. And, you know, we can, we can talk about that, how they apply to American monuments or monuments in the world today, like um, statues, you know, Saddam being taken down or where we, you and I thrive, like in the ancient world. Um, mm -hmm. There seem to be so many different ways in which this stuff is encountered. Right. Right. Well, and that's really the operative aspect of monuments is that they are encountered and that encounter matters. I think that in colloquial terms, we'll use the word monument and we mean like just a big stone, anything. Um, but when we're talking about it in a scholarly sense, if it doesn't, if you can't demonstrate decently well that it matters, it's not monumental. Huh. Um, so like one of my favorite counter examples, which is oddly relevant given current events is um, the eye that cries monument. Um, nobody has ever heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about it's it. A, it's a September 11th monument. Um, that's, it's a big like stone with a gash in the middle and a single teardrop. Um, but it was donated to the U.S. by Russia after September 11th. Um, and they put it in New Jersey and it's got, it's supposed to have a list of everybody who passed in the attack, but the, the list is wrong and nobody knows that it's there um, and nobody cares. And I, it would probably have almost the opposite effect if people like discovered it and knew that it was given to us by Putin. Yeah. But, but that's a, it doesn't matter. Like it's a massive stone structure and nobody, there's nobody to receive it. So even though it was produced to be a monument, that's, that was the intention behind it. It's really not from a, a scholarly perspective because nobody's experiencing it. Nobody's like, it's just a big piece of stone. It's not doing anything to the people around it. Yeah, I mean, maybe we can consider it art or something, but you know, yeah. th it's surprising that it's in Jersey and not, uh -huh. you know, you would think the monument has a certain meaning where it is. And if it's a 9-11 right. monument, uh, like, I'm sure, you know, hundreds, if not, you know, more than a thousand people from Jersey died. Uh, I have, I don't have numbers on that, but you know, people commute to the city and it's, it's natural, but at the same time, you know, like who's going to encounter it? Is it the families, right? Like, I mean, right. gravestones, they have their setting at, at the interment of the body, you know, or wherever the body is commemorated. And so people go there, you know, for that commemoration and that marker has meaning like you're saying, right? But this being yeah. in Jersey, you know, like I, no wonder, right? And, and probably if it was in, you know, lower Manhattan, it might be, um, it might be a monument. Right. So that's a great point. Um, kind of gets at what we were talking about earlier off camera, I guess. The, I like to think of three major ways that monuments are encountered. Um, this is obviously being combined when you're actually encountering it, but it helps us to talk about it. But um, say we encounter monuments visually so that something that we we look at i'd say also tactily if you're allowed to touch it a lot of modern ones you aren't i think that that may not have been as true in other cultures of the ancient world um verbally if it has a text somebody talks about it somebody reads it off um in modern times most of us are literate and we will mm. read it ourselves right um and not true in the ancient world, but somebody could have read it off. Um, and then spatially, 
like it matters where it is. It matters how we get there, how we move around it. If we do anything else in that space to engage with it, and those are all ways of kind of communicating um, meaning and importance. Um, so if you get that verbal and visual part right, which the eye that cries also messes up the ver verbal part because the list of names is wrong. Uh, the visual is quite striking. I'd recommend looking it up. It's a very striking piece of art. Uh, but the spatial thing is just totally off. Because um, I've heard of people finding it by accident. Like it's not <laughs> a part of Jersey that people go to. No. Um, it's just like nobody knows what it is or what it is doing there. So, well, when you, you talked about, um, you know, the idea of literacy and performance, that's, you know, a key theme in, in a lot of the classes I teach, you know, just the um, getting students to realize that literacy is on a mass scale is still pretty new in world history, you know, and maybe, um, you know, the last hundred years or so is what we're looking at. And uh, that being the case, um, you think about these ancient monuments too, and the reading of them, someone there to read them, right? And I know some of the stuff that you and I have, have looked at in the past, um, they'll be in languages that are either, you know, maybe they're accessible in, in the sense of, you know, like people will, you know, argue for the, you know, the, that the alphabet democratizes or it makes reading easier or whatever. But uh, that's in contrast to something like hieroglyphic or, or Akkadian or something that, you know, really requires a different sort of scribal training. So um, either way, whatever the case is, you still only have X amount of a population that can read it when they encounter it, right? Yes. And um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that you have done a lot of work in, in performance of these monuments and you know what does something like uh, monumental performance look like I mean I, I know the the idea of reading it is one thing but I think um, you know the other part lost is that you know something else happens typically you know around uh, the object yeah so it really depends on which one we're talking about but mm -hmm they basically get roped into like ancient, the ancient equivalents of like parades and festivals. Um, so if you think of a uh, site I've been looking at a lot recently, Karkamesh, um, as you know, it's one of the most influential cities in really both the Iron and the Late Bronze Age. Yeah. So like 1500 BC to I think around 700 is when the Assyrians finally conquer it. Yeah. Um, and it survives, but it's not as important after that. But just unparalleled in terms of its monuments and monumental art. But the, those monuments are laid out at strategic points in the city, all moving towards this plaza in the center of the city that surround and the temples of the, the major deities. Um, at least the ones that were found or that we found. There's one that's missing still. And that plaza is big enough to hold about 9,000 people. Um, the population of Karkamesh was probably 18,000. Okay. And so when you factor out people like children, and I guess people who are like above a certain, like old enough that they're not walking around the city that much, you basically get like, you can fit every able-bodied adult in that plaza at, at a given time. So it's theorized in the inscriptions state as much that possibly on a yearly basis, maybe more often, but they definitely say a yearly basis, like you process through the city and into that plaza and gather. And then if you look at the inscriptions, they imply an order that they're supposed to be read so that you come in through what's called the King's Gate. It's so be like portraits, wall reliefs. 
Mm -hmm. you come into the open area um, at which point you're facing the temple of the storm god but there's a wall so you can't actually get into the temple so you have to turn and then you're in this much bigger open area follow along this wall and there's all these pictures of processing figures so it sort of shows you where to walk um, you end up at the, the grand staircase, which is actually a pretty massive staircase, even by, by modern standards, the stone staircase leading up to the true Acropolis. And then you can finally get to the temple of the storm god, which is the main god there. Um, but probably going along with this procession, essentially, you're parading through the city, um, you'd have specialists reading these things off. Um, so that's what I think. It's not made explicit, but all the inscriptions here are in uh, Luvian. And Luvian has a sort of, uh, it's a quotation mark, but it's part of the language. Like it's a thing you have to say to Mar like this is direct speech. This is supposed to be read out loud. And all of these inscriptions are, are filled with them. Like every single line we get that. So it's, it's supposed to be read. It's not read aloud. It's not something that you just look at. Um, and then of course that would end with like all these religious practices at the temples. Um, and on top of that, this is potentially the only time of year that the majority of those people get to go there and do that. Cause otherwise this part of the city is, is going to be closed off. It's the Acropolis. It's for the upper class. It's not for your common Archimedeans. Hmm. They get to go during the festival. Um, I suspect that we have similar stuff going around all over the region. Um, different kinds of practices, different kinds of restrictions, but that we would get these sorts of parades, essentially. Um, or, I mean, almost like a passion play. I guess, where the, yeah. everybody gets to come out and participate. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, that's a tradition you see in, um, you know, Eastern Christianity, especially, well, not just Eastern, Western Christianity, too, where, um, you know, the, the Catholic tradition, they'll have the um, statue of the same, but the East, they'll have an icon, you know, or something two-dimensional. Um, and the, the uh, ritual procession will have, depending on what the feast is, um, it will have moments, um, you know, of reading or prayer, you know, and maybe they stop at a certain point. I participated in one not too long ago, um, you know, where there's a, 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 a Syriac uh, church here in Houston that's pretty big, and it, it's, it tries to replicate some of the um, compound level um, hmm. features, you know, that it, it has in the old country. And, you know, um, there's several large stone crosses and, you know, you'll, you'll go around the church and then you'll come stop at the cross and the, the priest will sense it and, you know, do specific prayers and what have you. Um, I think the difference in that is nothing that's written, you know, monumentally is uh -huh. being read but at the same time and i think probably in the ancient world that's the case too because procession is you know, procession and liturgy typically were memorized right it's their their right. design is is for you know uh, memory and um but it, it doesn't mean that you know it, it's not the case i'm trying to think of you know the what do they call it the via dolorosa the um the roman oh, catholic yeah. tradition where they you know, remember the different stages of the, um, you know, the crucifixion. Twelve you know? stations, yeah. The station of the cross, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know the terms. Um, you know, it's something similar, you know, where you process through um, space and space activates memory, right? Yeah. Well, it's... it's it's an external version of like the memory palace that people started to know what it was when, when Sherlock was popular, although I think they kind of get it wrong. But there's like this ancient idea of the loci method of memory 
which you memorize using locations. And we hear that today. And maybe there were some ancient people who thought of it that way, where it's like, oh, I imagine going to a place and in that place, I attach all these certain memories. But it's actually probably more literal in that you go to a place and there are certain memories associated with it. And I know for myself that that's like, there's memories that I only have when I'm in California because that's where I grew up. Absolutely. It's difficult for me to access them when I'm not there. Um, and that would be the same when, if you attached, I mean, specific kind of memories, like when we stand in the gate, we remember that this thing happened in our history or when we go to this station of the cross, we remember this part of, of the gospel. Um, I think it's important also a point that is not mentioned enough that especially in the ancient world, outside of these kinds of contexts, there was no public art. Like you didn't go to a museum and look at art. You didn't go to a theater and like watch a show. That only happened in this context. Um, Theater is more in the classical you know. era than the, uh, the ancient, you know, bronze iron age, but. Right. Yeah. Um, even when you get to the classical era, if, like as it's becoming more intentionally fictive, there's still kind of a, a strong religious component, I feel. Like it's, it's growing out of ritual practice. Um, so it's interesting to follow that into things like the Eastern Christian tradition and the, the Western Christian tradition, because it's just the way we've always uh, acted. I was reflecting on this recently, being a Protestant, all that's been neutered out of <laughs> our religion. And I think it, there's a reason why Protestantism doesn't emerge until the modern era, because you can do that without the, the church now. Um, I, just, I don't think we're self-reflective enough about that, like the kinds of traditions that have emerged in the wake of that couldn't exist before. You had to have a church calendar. You had to go to church to be moved aesthetically by the art and the performance. And that was a huge part of how the, the message was maintained and, and spread. Um, that's exactly what we're seeing in the ancient period with, with these monuments. You're inculcating a story into a people. Yeah. Um, like teaching them how to think about themselves and everything else in their environment. Yeah. The, the aesthetic, you know, quality to it is, um, you know, like you said, it, it, there is no art for art's sake. It, it's art, you know, with directed purpose. It's aesthetics, you know, the working in um, the capacity that they're designed to um in these cases and you know within the um you know the i'm sure this this predates christianity of course but in the eastern christian tradition they'll speak of iconography you know um the icon you know graphene right the writing with image is so yeah. you read icons i mean it's it's also the word for painting but uh, you know you you read an icon and, you know and it's a, a nice way to think of it because you don't have a lot of, um, oh, who's the artist? I, I'm, I'm losing it, but it's at the Norton Simon um, in Pasadena. There's a, um, an image of Joseph and the baby Jesus. And the undertext is a traditional icon uh, presentation, which isn't too different than the Theotokos and, and child where, you know, you have, you know, the, the child here. Oh, but then yeah. um, the over image you know, is the development where Joseph is like, Hey, I got a baby in my hands. Um, and like that breaks the convention. Right. And that's because yeah. there are certain forms that existed across icons where you see the icon and you read it, you know, and anyone who cannot read the inscription, you know, can still connect with the aesthetic quality of, you know, the, the image in here, you know, Karkamesh, for example, there, it's not just text, right? Like there's right. imagery accompanying the text. I'm, I'm guessing in all cases, I don't know because I haven't done a full survey, but I've, I've seen enough. You probably could comment more on that. Yeah, at Karkamesh, um, you don't have text by themselves. 
um, there's always some sort of artistic component. And I mean, we tend to read them as modern scholars as like, oh, this is a block of text. This is a block of images. And a lot of that has to do with when the British excavated it, they like hacked it apart and labeled each of those pieces. Yeah. But this was supposed to all be encountered together. I mean, when you like go to, um, I'm thinking of the opera house in San Francisco, but like you don't look at the paintings on the ceiling or the wall and think of them as separate pieces. It's all part of the same theater. And that's what, what Karkamesh was. You're supposed to have these things together. Um, and there's also not a, I mean, following on that idea of like icon being writing and picture and painting, the, there's not a strong distinction at Karkamesh and for most people in the ancient world, probably not between writing and, and image. My favorite example at Karkamesh is the, the ruler Katuas has this inscription with a full length portrait of himself um, in profile and he's pointing at himself like this. Um, he is the first hieroglyph. If you, Amumi. If you don't, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amuami. If, if you don't read that portrait, the rest of the inscription doesn't make sense because um, it just starts with some random like syllables that don't follow off of anything. You have to read the portrait to make sense of it. Um, and there's this idea that even for the, the illiterate part of the audience, the, the writing even if it wasn't being read, it would have been encountered visually. But you see the hieroglyphs, and even if you can't read them, they have a visual content. Just in, I mean, they're very pictographic, so they kind of tell a story on their own. But seeing them in certain contexts communicates something. The, the Archimedeans carve these really beautiful, large hieroglyphs all over the walls and that says something about like this is an important tradition that we have have cultivated um i suspect that it's the same for the alphabet in many cases however much it democratized writing and you probably still had a sizable portion of the population who couldn't read it right but it was important to see it carved there um i mean i think of sort of modern parallel would be like uh, Top Copy Palace in Istanbul has all these really beautiful um, works of, I would call it calligraphy. I think they might have a different name for it there, but all like the Sultan's name, like signatures in Arabic and verses from the Quran. And it's so developed that even knowing some Arabic I can't read any of it, but it's so visually striking. Like it's a, it's memorable and meaningful to encounter those when you're walking through the palace. You know, when you were talking about, um, you know, Katuas, um, it, it made me think of kind of the contrast between, I mean, I don't know how, uh, how similar we have anything today, um, that's relatable. I mean, I'm thinking of Washington, D.C., right? And you've, you've got this part of Washington, D.C. where all the memorials are. And, you know, you can process through the memorials and encounter the history and encounter, you know, the text that's presented on the different memorials commemorating, you know, the fallen soldiers or the war um, and things like that. But with Katuas and, um, and Karkamish, and, and I mean, that, look, a lot of Luwian inscriptions, right? You know, it's the um, it's the finger pointing to the face that indicates the first person, and so mm -hmm. it's it's not just the Luwian inscriptions too. I mean, I, it seems like a lot of the ancient Near Eastern inscriptions, like they're people speaking. Yeah. You know, and uh, there's this first person aspect to it. It's not like, you know, um, here we commemorate the fallen, you know, of the you know two ninety third, you know, or the. Um, you know, or in Boston, you know, you see the 54th Massachusetts commemoration, the relief, you know, um, by the, the state house and everything. And uh, there it's the person speaking to you. Right. And so part of the performance is the, the life and the, the living aspect of those people from those places who not just built the, 
maybe built buildings in the places, but built the idea of the place itself, right? You know, and built the identity. Um, you said that about Ozymandias earlier, right? It's like his ghost is talking, you know? Yeah. And that's uh, like, when I think of ancient inscriptions, that's kind of the, the deal. Like, it, it's not just, it's not just art. It's not just a record of something. I built this, you know, okay, a lot, <laughs> they talk about their accomplishments, but to what end, right? Yeah, well, it's one thing I've never really said as much in my writing, but I think that memorial is a terrible category for the ancient Near East. I think it doesn't exist because none of this stuff is there to be describing something. It's not like you come to a monument and it's like what you see here is such and such or we're remembering this it's like in the west where we focus a lot of our attention most of it is i am so and so and i did this and how great am i and so now you need to do this in response um but from as far as we can tell like the way these people talked about art and set it up it's never just an object gets imbued with a sort of life of its own. So that when Katuas is pointing at himself, that's not a picture of Katuas. In a sense, it is him um, from an ancient perspective. Like that's how you encounter Katuas. And that's what made their monuments so meaningful to them is it wasn't just a way to remember Katuas, it was a way to access him. Yeah. Um, even after he died. Um, and you move on to uh, like a century later and you get um, Yadidis comes in as the ruler. He's one of my favorite guys because he has that inscription about I spoke 12 languages and I know how to read cuneiform while well, all writing in hieroglyphs. <laughs> um, but He used the uh, cuneiform translation of hieroglyphs to learn, right? <laughs> right. Um, but he puts, he goes into that same plaza with Katuas and rips out one of the walls and then puts in his own little procession ending on this main inscription describing his rule. But he had to incorporate Katuas into the uh, way that he changed the plaza. So he like kind of shifted the figures so that they're all marching towards him instead of towards the temple of the storm god. And as a result, now it looks like Katuas is also marching towards him. Um, but he had to like recruit this old image. He couldn't just get rid of Katuas. Um, he had to work him in and because in a sense, he's still like a living part. Of the yeah, and be ritualized destruction, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you have that all over the place. Zainab Bahrani, it's, uh, I can't remember if she's at NYU or at Columbia. I don't think it's NYU, but she has, she's more known for her book, The Graven Image, but she also wrote this book called The Infinite Image. It's really fun. So it's comparing ancient Near Eastern art to modern art, um, but really harps on this idea of like the image is something living and vital, uh, which is, circling back to a, a similar topic why i think it's so important that then the hebrew bible picks up on that man is the image of god mm -hmm. humankind is the, the image of god i've been complaining recently that um one of the sort of neologisms in english at least in protestant english that i hate is image bearer is, you know mm bear the image you are the image like that's what's meaningful that you're the image you're the instantiation of the living god I mean, when you're operating within these sort of correct ritual parameters very yeah that's um i hadn't uh made that connection before but then again i hadn't used the term <laughs> but <laughs> yeah i'm thinking as i as we're going through monuments, you know, and um, like the, there, there is a transition point, right? Where something happens from what we're talking about in the ancient world to 
yeah, I, I don't know. I don't want to call it third person or, you know, going from first person to third person, but um, it, it just today versus the ancient world, there is a, a distance in, in styles. I know in, in different parts of the world, there's inscriptions that are quotations and maybe they're classical or medieval, um, but they quote things. And that, that might be the, you know, I'm thinking out loud here, that might be the, the transition itself to where it's not the person speaking so much as it was in the ancient examples, you know, where you have these first person narrations. Instead, you know, if it's quotations, it's quotative, it's the, um, the content perhaps of what's being quoted that matters. Maybe it's a refrain, right? Like there's middle Persian around a number of crosses in India, you know, mm -hmm. and they, they're dedicatory. It looks like, um, but they contain, um, you know, either praise or may, uh, I don't know if they mentioned the builder, um, you know, other times you'll have an inscription, um, well, there's a lot that are commemorative, right? You know, I'm thinking of the Aramaic inscriptions in Turab Din and you know, the different um, monasteries and things there. Uh, but if, if it's a quotation of something, you know, what's the purpose of the quotation? You know, I, I think that it creates a, um, well, there's a lot going on. I think part of it is you create a degree of separation between you and the thing. And then the monument just becomes a sort of medium for relaying it. So when you're quoting something, you're implying like this was said at another time by another person at another place. Um, and this is just a record of it as opposed to like Katuas, I am, like he's speaking every time, every time that's read, every time you read it. Um, it's not a record of something that he said once because it's being put in the first person present tense. It's, that, it's like dislocated from the past. It's done right. to the present all the time. And it seems um, that, um, just to jump in real quick, it, it seems like there's a, a shift sort of in worldview and if yes. you no longer, you know, are, are encountering those who aren't bodily, or at least the body they inhabit is, um, you know, the human body is no longer present. Um, you know, if that worldview then transitions to something else, you know, and probably it's, it's around the time of the classical era, you know, when you have um the recession of the ancient near eastern cults you know and the the growth of of um well it's not even just christianity i mean it could be the the gnostic you know traditions and the um everything that sort of comes around the the collision of the um roman and eastern worlds you know okay maybe it's a great yeah. greek agency i don't know um but it seems like a transition in worldview, kind of maybe dictating the way monuments develop. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't necessarily want to lay everything at the feet of uh, Plato, but you kind of can <laughs> blame his idea of dualism. Um, Anyone who does as much as Plato did, you know, and made like, he's, he's, he's the real contributor, right? So, yeah. We can, you know, praise and criticize in the, at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously came up with a lot of really important ideas, but also kind of drove things in some interesting, not necessarily productive directions. Um, but I think one of the things you get is um, the way he talks about like signs um, and representations. And there comes to be this hard boundary between a sign and a signified and that plays into like the idea of the mind and the body um it's just interesting if you look at this just philologically like what is the ancient hebrew word for body yeah um there isn't one we could come up with some 
um, that sort of describe that, but they don't really have a concept of like, this is the body apart from the soul mm-hmm. because it wouldn't occur to separate them. That's why the, like the Hebrew word nefesh. Yeah. I was going to default to nefesh, to but like, what else do we but have? It, right. But when does goof translate it as soul, but there's places where it can be used to mean corpse. Goof, I think it is in the Bible. I can't remember if it falls into a specific period or not. It's not a very common word. Not an not an ancient Hebrew, anyways. I don't think I've ever seen it in an inscription, and it's not that common in the biblical text, to my knowledge. I was looking this up recently because I was trying to think of like what is the the word for this. Um, and I was re- I was reading some on uh, Homer recently, and they pointed out that in Homeric Greek, there's not really a clear word for for body it wouldn't occur Mm. to differentiate my body versus myself in that okay which we we think he's coming out of the 8th century bc we get plato a few centuries later and then we start to get like these really developed terms so that when you get to the new testament you've got sihi and yeah sarks although they aren't necessarily being used in the greek way i would argue um but there starts to be this like hard separation between those things. And that plays into how we view art, that it can become just a representation or an abstraction, as opposed to being a participation in the real. Um, so why you go from like the Egyptians having to cut off the arms of the hieroglyphs or tie them up so that they didn't come to life yeah. Um, or the Assyrians chaining down the Lamassu. Um, to today, you just kind of paint whatever you want and you don't really think anything about it. Although I would argue that there is a, there's a dimension of people just thinking of art um, or monuments as being living that you can't erase. Like going back to your gravestone example. I was reading this study of a gravestone that I thought was really interesting that it made the point that for people who speak to the dead at graves, they don't address the body, they address the stone. If you go to a cemetery, even though presumably the the ashes or the coffin is just below the stone, they don't come and and do this and, and talk down towards the body. They speak at the stone. The stone becomes the person yeah in terms Um, of posture it's probably behind us too right like you know wherever it's been laid um where we're there with the stone you know that bears the name you know bears maybe some other a date at least um and if we're lucky something else yeah we don't consciously reflect on it enough but like it's very natural for i think the human mind to go there I think the best modern parallel, the, the scholarly world doesn't necessarily like it when I bring it up, is uh, social media. That I can look at pixels on a screen and be like, no, that's a person. It's a person that I talk to. Um, but that takes, it's such a leap of the imagination. That yeah. I don't even do consciously. You just ruined this podcast for me, man. Now I thought here I am sitting with you cross continents you know and it, it turns out i'm like I'm, I'm sitting in a room by myself and <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing all these hearing this binary manifest as audio and, and looking you know at, at this pixelated image of this person i i think i know right but it's it ain't you yeah i mean in a like it's hard science sense it's just electronically reproduced information but i mean for all intents and purposes like it is me like i am talking to you that's like the the power of i guess the, the human mind to engage with with things in this way um and, and that's what was being leveraged in the ancient world they didn't have computers, but they had chisels and plenty of mm-hmm. stone and they used it to do the same thing. Yeah. And it's, you know, as you talk about the problem of 
or or the the problems that dualism leads to, or and maybe they're not problems, but the the differences, um, depending on you know whatever your inclination is, we'll call them problems. Um, <laughs> other people may say the differences, but it seems like you know when we're we're encountering things prior to that dualism, we're seeing um, emanation, call it emanation, call it extension. And then when we get into dualism, those emanations or extensions, we might call product, right? There's a separation in what happens, you know, from, you know, um, what, what is as it moves, and um, I, I don't know, I mean, can we extend that to the idea of the sun? Are the rays of the sun rays, like the fact that we can coin that term, we can code it, and we can describe this stuff as a ray? Is it separate from the sun, or is it the presence of the sun? You know, and um, it, okay, it's not, it's certainly well beyond the curve. You know, but um, it, at what point does it detach? You know, is there a moment of detachment or is it an emanation? And, uh, you know, substantially the same sort of thing. Um, I don't know, a thought experiment, but it's, um, it, it seems similar. And ultimately, like you said, going back to, you know, the, the matter of dualism and how it, it reinterprets, you know, the, the, the things we otherwise encountered until that point. Right. Well, and I think it gets at a really interesting point that um, we have to be aware of doing this kind of scholarship. Or, I mean, just self-reflective of in general is where do we draw boundaries? Because a lot of it is determined by that, that worldview. I mean, going back to monuments being things that matter, Part of that is that there's not an easy boundary between the artifact and the community. Um, for the eye that cries, nobody goes there. It has mm -hmm. no community. Um, Carchemish or like the church in, in Houston, like apart from the people engaging it, like it dies. It's not, it's, it ceases to matter, but it needs people to matter too. Yeah. There's not a clean boundary I, I mean i don't know that the carcamesians necessarily thought of like this particular image of katua it's just well this is carcamesh and we are carcamesh we're carcamesh carcamesians and we come here and we we see these things um i think you get a similar thing and uh you brought this up so this was years ago we were talking about like theological boundary drawing i think one of the big sort of conflicts between East and West is that the West really wants hard boundaries. So you have like Homi Uzun, um, the, I want to say hypostatic union, but it's a different term. Diophysitism, like the two, two natures of Christ and never the twain shall meet, even though they're inextricable as opposed to miaphysitism, the two are like intermingled and yet complete that there's sort of a diaphysitism is coming out of this like dualist tendency. Like I want him to be human and divine, but I want human and divine to be separate things. To, yeah. yeah like the human and divine categories not really capturing the union that seems to be the, the tendency in the east yeah yeah that's a it's a good comparison um you know and it's that you know whether it's you know i would trace a lot of that too back to um tendencies of language but then again language is just it, outgrowth of thought right and so right. um how you think necessitates how you attempt to communicate how you think. And so, um, you know, like those of us Semites and Semiticists, we, 
we connect all sorts of weird ideas <laughs> because right. you know the the words are tied together and um mm -hmm. you know in the west whether it's english um or especially greek you know where um you have that intentionality between or behind the way in which language is coded and and, and specific and, and that's a brilliant thing too i mean it's not a it's not just a criticism it's a um it's an observation you know and it, it certainly led us yeah. in a different direction um you know in terms of human history but you know in the east you have this uh tendency you know toward connecting things um, because that you don't limit the scope as much uh, color is an interesting way of thinking about that too right like is blue different than green uh, i don't know like in yeah right you know so yeah. even in modern aramaic which you know um so it's like right. we, we have this background where we can look at different dialects of, I just said we speak Aramaic basically. And um, we have this, you know, landscape of places and locales. Are there different words for blue and green in the dialect, you know? Um, I know in... Uh, in certain villages, you know, um, in um, Northeastern Neo-Aramaic or modern Syriac, Assyrian, whatever um, term we want to call it, they'll call Milan like the word for blue and green, you know, even though classical Syriac has different words, you know, uh, is it the yeah. same in Urmijnaya or is it uh, in the Urmian dialect? Urmian. I was taught had a word for green. Um, and I have to switch out of Japanese. <laughs> That's my daily life. But I believe it was Kina. Um, yeah, sure. Okay, that that's the vegetation. Was Milano, was yeah, vegetation yeah, so and it's, spring. It's coming from that. And of course, Udamish Naya is heavily impacted by Farsi, so that may be. Part but you know the, the point remains still right like there's you know colors that's a matter of perception and um i know the whole um you know eskimo with where the inuit with snow you know bit right. and you know um but I mean, we do know that the hawaiians had a couple words for lava right all in oi oi right. and so like if you have a reason to convey something as separate you take that reason for conveying that and then you code it that way and uh, whether it's colors and i had this talk actually a couple months ago a student brought it up to me about the colors and you know uh, our ability to see different wavelengths and whatever <laughs> like it, it yeah. all the there are reasons is the point right and if you right. don't have a reason to separate um you probably will not find a way to express that and so you know with regard to uh, monuments you know it, it's a, it seems that's the same sort of idea and, and going back to what you said about not just the monument but the performative aspect of the monument as mm -hmm. part of the city as part of the people right like there's there's a certain degree of inseparability that right. seems to I, I don't know if it's the point you know if we can think of it that way if it's just um nothing else to do and <laughs> that's what they did <laughs> you know um i don't know but uh, it, it seems in the same ballpark for sure i think yes and there's not there's not a reason to separate them in the ancient world like you don't have the concept, there's not a motivation to. Um, and then the aspect I'm starting to work on is like, you can actually demonstrate mathematically apparently, although I can't really follow all of the equations that this it's directly related to social stability. Um, that like the, the distance people move increases like how much they interact and if you can improve the quality of those interactions you stabilize 
um, a settlement. Um, now, you can't guarantee that you're going to do that by throwing monuments in. Um, but if everybody stayed at home and like basically does the corona thing, yeah, you, you don't end up with a community. Yeah. Um, like you create a community by bringing people together and kind of doing something together. And that's why you wouldn't have a, a clean uh, distinction. I mean, that's where like liturgy is when I hear the word in English, I think of a sheet of paper that tells me what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> uh, but the, the Greek means the work of the people. It's the people right. working together. Like, and that's what kind of brings the people into, into being in a sense. I mean, that's why I like, uh, and this is true across the board religiously, what initiation rites are like things we do communally. Like you yeah. are baptized in front of a community, you confess in front of a community. Um, if you do those in private, you don't have the, the church as such. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point too, right? Like, I mean, people, they'll go to the baptism late or they'll miss it and then go to the party, uh -huh. <laughs> right? Like <laughs> the excuse for people to come together has now ended, but we're still together. Um, yeah. Well, listen, I think this has been a, a, an insightful discussion and I, I think you, you've given me an idea to have you back. Maybe we talk about um, iconoclasm and image and text destruction, you know, next time since we're, you know, yeah. we're talking about, you know, getting the monuments up there, why they're up there. But, um, you know, there's certainly another aspect to it, whether it's Corona style separation, or maybe the community comes together to, to bash in the, you know, the, yeah, to destroy something. Um, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Um, I mean, I guess it's kind of wrapping up a uh, thing I would invite people to, to think about is like monuments are, are things that matter to groups of, of people. Um, and it's worth thinking about like what those things are in our context. It's not necessarily the Washington Monument. Mm. It could be something like a, a really powerful piece of liturgy, or I like to use the example of the Constitution. Yeah, that's definitely a, a key example, I think. Uh, well, I appreciate you coming on, you know, and uh, you know, encountering your pixels. <laughs> if I'm a dualist, I'm just talking to your pixels and listening to, you know, the, the binary output. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, say, say hi to all the non-pixelated people out there, and we'll definitely have you on again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, brother, take care.